I'd like to invite my friend and colleague and someone who's been uh, very helpful to us in organizing this symposium and who just came back from the student government dealing with these issues, uh, Dan Meltzer. So it's a special pleasure for me to introduce my friend and former colleague, John Brennan, who has a very long job title, the Deputy National Security Advisor and Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Let me start with the facts and figures. A graduate of Fordham University with a master's in government from the University of Texas, John joined the CIA in 1980. Um, it's reported that while he was riding a bus to Fordham, he saw in the New York Times an ad that the CIA was seeking some good new people, and recognizing his own wanderlust, he thought he should pursue the opportunity. That decision launched a very distinguished 25-year career at the CIA, which included service in the field in the Middle East, where the newspapers report, I'm being careful here, that he was the uh, station chief in a major Middle Eastern capital, as well as important jobs at headquarters in the analytic field and uh, in policy matters. John has been a key actor in shaping the government's response to 9-11. In 2003, he was the founding director of the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, which served as a clearinghouse for the collection and analysis of information from the multiple intelligence agencies in the government. And he did that until that function was taken over by the National Center for Counterterrorism, which he also directed. For his government service, he has received a long list of medals, all of which are uh, recited in the program, and I won't go through all of them uh, just now. In his current position, John is the principal White House official responsible for the formulation, coordination, and implementation of policies relating to counterterrorism. This covers a very broad range, including assessing the daily threat reports, which by their nature are often anything but conclusive, engaging in del delicate diplomacy with foreign leaders, monitoring the planning and execution of sensitive operations, some well-known, like the Osama bin Laden raid, others still covert. And recall that he's the assistant to the president for homeland security as well as for counterterrorism. And so to take just one example, when there was a risk of a pandemic from H1N1, that too fell into John's portfolio. Now, I thought it'd be good to try to spice up this introduction with some good stories about John, and so I contacted several of his close associates at the White House. Um, what I got back was universal admiration, repeated admiration of his dry wit, and everyone remarked that in a building where the hours are insanely long, John is usually the first one in and the last one out. But I got no stories. So apparently John either doesn't have any colorful idiosyncrasies or he's a master of his CIA tradecraft and they're all undercover. Um, but what is entirely out in the open is that John is quite simply a professional's professional who in a difficult and contentious space has earned the deep respect of all who know him. That respect results, I think, not simply from his expertise, his intelligence, or his tireless work, but also from his character. John is the straightest of straight shooters. When he says he knows something, which he usually does, he'll tell you. And when he doesn't know, he'll also tell you. He doesn't seek credit for successes, and when, as inevitably happens, something misfires, he steps forward to accept the blame, even when it isn't really his fault. In this most stressful of jobs, he remains gentle in manner, and he sees all angles of a problem. And notably for this conference and this law school, he is deeply concerned about maintaining our civil liberties and bolstering the reputation of the United States throughout the world. And so we could not be more fortunate than to have as our keynote speaker today, John Brennan. Well, thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you very much for those very kind words. 
and it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here at an inaugural event at the uh, opening of an amazingly beautiful building here on the campus of, of Harvard. And I want to thank Dan for the service that he has provided to this nation in both the judicial and executive branches. Uh, you made me blush, so I may make you blush. At the White House, Dan helped us navigate some of the most complex legal issues related to our efforts to keep the American people safe. And I know that President Obama is very grateful for his service. And I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to sit through his many law tutorials during national security meetings in the White House Situation Room. And I dare say that those tutorials were a tad less expensive than what some of you are currently paying for his pearls of wisdom. <laughs> And it's a pleasure to be here at Harvard Law School, and I want to acknowledge Dean Minow and members of the staff and faculty who are here tonight. I especially want to thank Professor Gabriel Bloom and Benjamin Wittes of the Brookings Institution for being the driving force behind your new program on law and security. The preservation of our national security and the laws that define us as the United States of America demand that we understand the intersection of the two, indeed how they reinforce one another. So I commend you for your efforts. We look forward to your contributions, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here with you on your inaugural event. And it's wonderful to see a number of friends and colleagues who I've had the privilege to work with over many years, David Barron, his wife Juliet, and others, public servants who have devoted their lives to protecting our nation. And let me say what a thrill it is to see so many students here this evening. I just hope that your choice to listen to me tonight is not an indictment of your social lives. <laughs> Being from Fordham, I was told also to uh, you know, s say a special word to the Harvard students. I'm sorry you weren't able to get into Fordham Law School, but you'll get a good law degree here anyway. <laughs> now, I am not a lawyer, despite ben Dan's best efforts. I am the President's Senior Advisor on Counterterrorism and Homeland Security. And in this capacity, and during more than 30 years working in intelligence and on behalf of our nation's security, I've developed a profound appreciation for the role that our values, especially the rule of law, play in keeping our country safe. It's an appreciation, of course, understood by President Obama, who, as you may know, spent a little time here himself. That's what I want to talk to you about this evening, how we have strengthened and continue to strengthen our national security by adhering to our values and our laws. Obviously, the death of Osama bin Laden marked a strategic milestone in our effort to defeat al-Qaeda. Unfortunately, bin Laden's death and the death and capture of many other al-Qaeda leaders and operatives does not mark the end of that terrorist organization or its efforts to attack the United States and other countries. Indeed, al-Qaeda, its affiliates, and its adherents remain the preeminent security threat to our nation. The core of al-Qaeda, its leadership based in Pakistan, though severely crippled, still retains the intent and capability to attack the United States and our allies. Al-Qaeda's affiliates in places like Pakistan and Yemen and countries throughout Africa carry out its murderous agenda. And Al-Qaeda adherents, individuals, sometimes with little or even no contact with the group itself, have succumbed to its hateful ideology and worked to facilitate or conduct attacks here in the United States, as we saw so tragically at Fort Hood. In the face of this ongoing and evolving threat, the Obama administration has worked to establish a counterterrorism framework that has been effective in enhancing the security of our nation. This framework is guided by several core principles. First, our highest priority is and always will be the safety and security of the American people. As President Obama has said, we have no greater responsibility as a government. Second, we will use every lawful tool and authority at our disposal. No single agency or department has sole responsibility for this fight because no single department or agency possesses all the capabilities needed for this fight. Third, we are pragmatic, not rigid or ideological, making decisions not based on preconceived notions about which actions seem stronger, but based on what will actually enhance the security of this country and the safety of the American people. We address each threat and each circumstance in a way that best serves our national security interests, which include building par partnerships with countries around the world. Fourth, and the principle that guides all our actions, foreign and domestic, we will uphold the core values that define us as Americans, and that includes adhering to the rule of law. And when I say all our actions, 
That includes covert actions, which we undertake under the authorities provided to us by Congress. President Obama has directed that all our actions, even when conducted out of public view, remain consistent with our laws and our values. For when we uphold the rule of law, governments around the world are more likely to provide us with the intelligence we need to disrupt ongoing plots. They're more likely to join us in taking swift and decisive action against terrorists. And they're more likely to turn over suspected terrorists who are plotting to attack us, along with the evidence needed to prosecute them. When we uphold the rule of law, our counterterrorism tools are more likely to withstand the scrutiny of our court, courts, our allies, and the American people. And when we uphold the rule of law, it provides a powerful alternative to the twisted worldview offered by al-Qaeda. Where terrorists offer injustice, disorder, and destruction, the United States and its allies stand for freedom, fairness, equality, hope, and opportunity. In short, we must not cut corners by setting aside our values and flouting our laws, treating them like luxuries we cannot afford. Indeed, President Obama has made it clear we must reject the false choice between our values and our security. We are constantly working to optimize both. Over the past two and a half years, we have put in place an approach, both here, at home, and abroad, that will enable this administration and its successors, in cooperation with key partners overseas, to deal with the threat from al-Qaeda, its affiliates, and its adherents in a forceful, effective, and lasting way. In keeping with our guiding principles, the President's approach has been pragmatic, neither a wholesale overhaul nor a wholesale retention of past practices. Where the methods and tactics of the previous administration have proven effective and enhanced our security, we have maintained them. Where they did not, we have taken concrete steps to get us back on course. Unfortunately, much of the debate around our counterterrorism policies has tended to obscure the extraordinary progress that we have made over the past decade. So with the time I have left, I want to touch on a few specific topics that illustrate how our, our adherence to the rule of law advances our national security. First, our definition of the conflict. As the President has said many times, we are at war with al-Qaeda. In an indisputable act of aggression, Al-Qaeda attacked our nation and killed nearly 3,000 innocent people. And, as we were reminded just last weekend, Al-Qaeda seeks to attack us again. Our ongoing armed conflict with Al-Qaeda stems from our right, recognized under international law, to self-defense. An area in which there is some disagreement is the geographic scope of the conflict. The United States does not view our authority to use military force against Al-Qaeda as being restricted solely to hot battlefields like Afghanistan. Because we are engaged in an armed conflict with al-Qaeda, the United States takes the legal position that, in accordance with international law, we have the authority to take action against al-Qaeda and its associated forces without doing a separate self-defense analysis each and every time. And as President Obama has stated on numerous occasions, we reserve the right to take unilateral action if or when other governments are unwilling or unable to take the necessary actions themselves. That does not mean that we can use military force whenever we want and wherever we want. International legal principles, including respect for a state's sovereignty and the laws of war, impose important constraints on our ability to act unilaterally and on the way in which we can use force in foreign territories. Others in the international community including some of our closest allies and partners, take a different view of the geographic scope of the conflict, limiting it only to hot battlefields. As such, they argue that outside a hot battlefield, the United States can only act in self-defense against al-Qaeda when they are planning, engaging in, or threatening an armed attack against U.S. interests if it amounts to an imminent threat. In practice, the U.S. approach to targeting in the conflict with al-Qaeda is far more aligned with our allies' approach than many assume. This administration's counterterrorism efforts outside of Afghanistan are focused on those individuals who are a threat to the United States, whose removal would cause a significant, if even only a temporary, disruption of the plans and capabilities of al-Qaeda and its associated forces. Practically speaking, then, the question turns principally on how you defined imminence. We are finding increasing recognition in the international community 
that a more flexible understanding of imminence may be appropriate when dealing with terrorist groups, in part because the threats posed by non-state actors do not present themselves in the ways that evidence imminence in more traditional conflicts. After all, al-Qaeda does not follow a traditional command structure, wear uniforms, carry its arms openly, or mass its troops at the borders of the nations it attacks. Nonetheless, it possesses the demonstrated capability to strike with little notice and cause significant civilian and or military casualties. Over time, an increasing number of our international counterterrorism partners have begun to recognize that the traditional conception of what constitutes an imminent attack should be broadened in light of the modern day capabilities, techniques, and technological innovations of terrorist organizations. The convergence of our legal views with those of our international partners matters. The effectiveness of our counterterrorism activities depends on the assistance and the cooperation of our allies, who in ways public and private take great risks to aid us in this fight. But their participation must be consistent with their laws, including their interpretation of international law. Again, we will never abdicate the security of the United States to a foreign country or refrain from taking action when appropriate. But we cannot ignore the reality that cooperative counterterrorism activities are key to our national defense. The more our views and our allies' views on these questions converge without constraining our flexibility, the safer we will be as a country. We've also worked to uphold our values and the rule of law in a second area, our policies and practices here at home. As I said, we will use all lawful tools at our disposal, and that includes authorities under the renewed Patriot Act. We firmly believe that our intelligence gathering tools must enable us to collect the information we need to protect the American people. At the same time, these tools must be subject to appropriate oversight and rigorous checks and balances that protect the privacy of innocent individuals. As such, we have ensured that investigative techniques in the United States are conducted in a manner that is consistent with our laws and subject to the supervision of our courts. We have also taken administrative steps to institute additional checks and balances above and beyond what is required by law in order to better safeguard the privacy rights of innocent Americans. Our democratic values also include, and our national security demands, open and transparent government. Some information obviously needs to be protected. And since his first days in office, President Obama has worked to strike the proper balance between the security of the American, the security the American people deserve and the openness our democratic society expects. In one of his first acts, the President issued a new executive order on classified information that, among other things, reestablished the principle that all classified information will ultimately be declassified. The President also issued a Freedom of Information Act directive mandating that agencies adopt a presumption of disclosure when processing requests for information. The President signed into law the first Intelligence Authorization Act in over five years to ensure better oversight of intelligence activities. Among other things, the legislation revised the process for reporting sensitive intelligence activities to Congress and created an Inspector General for the intelligence community. For the first time, President Obama released the combined budget of the intelligence community and reconstituted the Intelligence Oversight Board, an important check on the government's intelligence activities. The President declassified and released legal memos that authorized the use, in earlier times, of enhanced interrogation techniques. Understanding that the reasons to keep those memos secret had evaporated, the President felt it was important for the American people to understand how those methods came to be authorized and used. The President, through the Attorney General, instituted a new process to consider invocation of the so-called state secrets privilege, where the government can protect information in civil lawsuits. This process ensures that this privilege is never used simply to hide embarrassing or unlawful government activities. But it also recognizes, recognizes that its use is absolutely necessary in certain cases for the protection of national security. And I know there has been some criticism of this administration on this issue. But by applying a stricter internal review process, including a requirement of personal approval by the Attorney General, we are working to ensure that this extraordinary power 
is asserted only when there is strong justification to do so. We've worked to uphold our values and the rule of law in a third area, the question of how to deal with terrorist suspects, including the significant challenge of how to handle suspected terrorists who were already in our custody when this administration took office. There are few places where the intersection of our counterterrorism efforts, our laws, and our values come together as starkly as it does at the prison in Guantanamo. By the, pre by the time President Obama took office, Guantanamo was viewed internationally as a symbol of a counterterrorism approach that flouted our laws and strayed from our values, undercutting the perceived legitimacy and therefore the effectiveness of our efforts. Aside from the, promises of in, the false promises of enhanced security, the purported legality of depriving detainees of their rights was soundly and repeatedly rejected by our courts. It came as no surprise then that before 2009, few counterterrorism proposals generated as much bipartisan support as those to close Guantanamo. It was widely recognized that the costs associated with Guantanamo ran high and the promised benefits never materialized. That was why, as Dan, Dave, and others know so well, on one of his first days in office, President Obama issued the executive order to close the prison at Guantanamo. Yet almost immediately, political support for closure waned. Over the last two years, Congress has placed unprecedented restrictions on the discretion of our experienced counterterrorism professionals to prosecute and transfer individuals held at the prison. These restrictions prevent these professionals who have carefully studied all of the available information in a particular case from exercising their best judgment as to what the most appropriate disposition is for each individual held there. The Obama administration has made its views on this issue very clear. The prison at Guantanamo Bay undermines our national security and our nation will be more secure the day when that prison is finally and responsibly closed. For all the reasons above, we will not send more individuals to the prison at Guantanamo. And we continue to urge Congress to repeal these restrictions and allow our experienced counterterrorism professionals to have the flexibility they need to make individualized, informed decisions about where to bring terrorists to justice and when and where to transfer those whom it, knows it is no longer in our interest to detain. This administration also undertook an unprecedented review of the detention and interrogation practices and their evolution since 2001 and we have confronted squarely the question of how we will deal with those we arrest or capture in the future, including those we take custody of overseas. Nevertheless, some have suggested that we do not have a detention policy, that we prefer to kill suspected terrorists rather than capture them. This is absurd, and I want to take this opportunity to set the record straight. As a former career intelligence professional, I have profound appreciation for the value of intelligence. Intelligence disrupts terrorist plots, thwarts attacks, and saves lives. And one of our greatest sources of intelligence about Al-Qaeda, its plans, and its intentions has been the members of its network who have been taken into custody by the United States and our partners overseas. So I want to be very clear. Whenever it is possible to capture a suspected terrorist, it is the unqualified preference of this administration to take custody of that individual so we can obtain information that is vital to the safety and security of the American people. This is how our soldiers and counterterrorism professionals have been trained. It is reflected in our rules of engagement, and it is the clear and unambiguous policy of this administration. Now, there has been a great deal of debate about the best way to interrogate individuals in our custody. It's been suggested that getting terrorists to talk can be accomplished simply by withholding Miranda warnings or subjecting prisoners to so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. It's also been suggested that prosecuting terrorists in our federal courts somehow impedes the collection of intelligence. A long record of experience, however, proves otherwise. Consistent with our laws and our values, the President unequivocally banned torture and other abusive interrogation techniques, rejecting the claim that these are effective means of interrogation. Instead, we have focused on what works, the President approved the creation of a high-value detainee interrogation group, referred to by its acronym HIG, to bring together resources from across the government, experienced interrogators, subject matter experts, intelligence analysts, and linguists, 
to conduct or assist in the interrogation of those terrorists with the greatest intelligence value, both at home and overseas. Through the HIG, we have brought together the capabilities that are essential to effective interrogation and ensure that they can be mobilized quickly and in a coordinated fashion. Claims that Miranda warnings undermine the intelligence collection ignore decades of experience to the contrary. Yes, some terrorism suspects have refused to provide information in the criminal justice system, but so too have many individuals held in military custody, from Afghanistan to Guantanamo, where Miranda warnings were not given. What is undeniable is that many individuals in the criminal justice system have provided a great deal of information and intelligence, even after being given Miranda warnings. The real danger is failing to give Miranda warnings in those circumstances where it's appropriate, which could well determine whether a terrorist is convicted and spends the rest of his or her life behind bars or is set free. Moreover, the Supreme Court has recognized a limited exce exception to Miranda, allowing statements to be admitted if the unwarned interrogation was reasonably prompted by a concern for public safety. Applying this public safety exception to the more complex and diverse threat of international terrorism can be complicated, so our law enforcement, law enforcement officers require clarity. Therefore, at the end of 2010, the FBI clarified its guidance to agents on the use of the public safety exception to Miranda, the Quarles exception, explaining how it should be applied to terrorism cases. The FBI has acknowledged that this exception was utilized last year including during the questioning of Faisal Shahzad, accused of attempting to detonate a car bomb in Times Square. Just this week, in a major terrorism case, a federal judge ruled that statements obtained under the public safety exception before the defendant was read his Miranda rights are, in fact, admissible at trial. Some have argued that the United States should simply hold suspected terrorists in law of war detention indefinitely. It is worth remembering, however, that for a variety of reasons, reliance upon military detention for individuals apprehended outside of Afghanistan and Iraq actually began to decline precipitously years before the Obama administration came into office. In the years following the 9-11 attacks, our knowledge of the al-Qaeda network increased and our tools with which to bring them to justice in federal courts or reform military commissions were strengthened, thus reducing the need for law of war detention. In fact, from 2006 to the end of 2008, when the previous administration apprehended terrorists overseas and outside of Iraq and Afghanistan, it brought more of those individuals to the United States to be prosecuted in our federal courts than it placed in long-term military detention at Guantanamo. When we succeed in capturing suspected terrorists who pose a threat to the American people, our other critical national security objective is to maintain a viable authority to keep those individuals behind bars. The strong preference of this administration is to accomplish that through prosecution, either in an Article III court or in reformed military commissions. Our decisions on which system to use in a given case must be guided by the factual and legal complexities of each case and relative strengths and weaknesses of each system. Otherwise, terrorists could be set free, intelligence lost, and lives put at risk. That said, it is the firm position of the Obama administration that suspected terrorists arrested inside the United States will, in keeping with long-standing tradition, be processed solely through our Article III courts, as they should be. Our military does not patrol our streets and enforce our laws, nor should it. This is not a radical idea, nor is the idea of prosecuting terrorists captured overseas in our Article III courts. Indeed, terrorists captured beyond our borders have been successfully prosecuted in our federal courts on many occasions. Our federal courts are time-tested, have unquestioned legitimacy, and, at least for the foreseeable future, are capable of producing a more predictable and sustainable result than military commissions. The previous administration successfully prosecuted hundreds of suspected terrorists in our federal courts, gathering valuable intelligence from several of them that helped our counterterrorism professionals protect the American people. In fact, every single suspected terrorist taken into custody on American soil before and after September 11th attacks has first been taken into custody by law enforcement. In the past two years alone, we have successfully interrogated several terrorism suspects who were taken into law enforcement custody and prosecuted, including Faisal Shahzad, 
Najibullah Zazi, David Headley, and many others. In fact, faced with the firm but fair hand of the American justice system, some of the most hardened terrorists have agreed to cooperate with the FBI, providing valuable information about al-Qaeda's network, safe houses, recruitment methods, and even their plots and plans. This is the outcome that all Americans should not only want, but demand from their government. Similarly, when it comes to U.S. citizens involved in terrorist-related activity, whether they are captured overseas or at home, we will prosecute them in our criminal justice system. There is bipartisan agreement that U.S. citizens should not be tried by military commissions. Since 2001, two U.S. citizens were held in military custody, and after years of controversy and extensive litigation, one was released, the other was prosecuted in federal court. Even as the number of U.S. citizens arrested for terrorist-related activity has increased, our civilian courts have proven that they are more than up to the job. In short, our Article III courts are not only our single most effective tool for prosecuting, convicting, and sentencing suspected terrorists, they are a proven tool for gathering intelligence and preventing attacks. For these reasons, credible experts from across the political spectrum continue to demand that our Article III courts remain an unrestrained tool in our counterterrorism toolbox. And where our counterterrorism professionals believe prosecution in our federal courts would best protect the full range of U.S. security interests and the safety of the American people, we will not hesitate to use them. The alternative, a wholesale refusal to utilize our federal courts, would undermine our values as well as our security. At the same time, however, reformed military commissions also have their place in our counterterrorism arsenal. Because of bipartisan efforts to ensure that military commissions provide all the core protections that are necessary to ensure a fair trial, we have restored the credibility of that system and brought it into line with our principles and our values. Where our counterterrorism professionals believe trying a suspected terrorist in our reformed military commissions would best protect the full range of U.S. security interests and the safety of the American people, we will not hesitate to utilize them to try such individuals. In other words, rather than a rigid reliance on just one or the other, we will use both our federal courts and reform military commissions as options for incapacitating terrorists. As a result of recent reforms, there are indeed many similarities between the two systems, and at times, these reform military commissions offer certain advantages. But important differences remain, differences that can determine whether a prosecution is more likely to succeed or to fail. For example, after Ahmed Warsami, a member of al-Shabaab with close ties to al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, was captured this year by U.S. military personnel, the President's national security team unanimously agreed that the best option for prosecuting him was our federal courts, where, among other advantages, we could avoid significant risks associated with and pursue additional charges not available in a military commission. And if convicted of certain charges, Ahmed Warsami faces a mandatory life sentence. In choosing between our federal courts and military commissions in any given case, this administration will remain focused on one thing, the most effective way to keep that terrorist behind bars. The only way to do this is to let our experienced counterterrorism professionals determine, based on the facts and circumstances of each case, which system will best serve our national security interests. In the end, the Obama administration's approach to detention, interrogation, and trial is simple. We have established a practical, flexible, results-driven approach that maximizes our intelligence collection and preserves our ability to prosecute dangerous individuals. Anything less, particularly a rigid, inflexible approach, would be disastrous. It would tie the hands of our counterterrorism professionals by eliminating tools and authorities that have been absolutely essential to their success. That brings me to the, a final area where upholding the rule of law strengthens our security, our work with other nations. As we have seen from Afghanistan in the 1990s to Yemen, Somalia, and the tribal areas of Pakistan today, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates often thrive where there is disorder or where central governments lack the ability to effectively govern their own territory. In contrast, helping such countries build a robust legal framework coupled with effective institutions to enforce them and the transparency and fairness to sustain them can serve as one of our most effective weapons against groups like al-Qaeda, 
by eliminating the very chaos that organization needs to survive. That is why a key element of this administration's counterterrorism strategy is to help governments build their capacity, including a robust and balanced legal framework to provide for their own security. Though tailored to the unique circumstances of each country, we are working with countries in key locations to help them enact robust counterterrorism laws and establish the institutions and mechanisms to effectively enforce them. The establishment of a functioning criminal justice system and institutions has played a key role in the security gains that have been achieved in Iraq. We are working to achieve similar results in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Pakistan, and elsewhere. These efforts are not a blank check. As a condition of our funding, training, and cooperation, we require that our partners comply with certain legal and humanitarian standards. At times, we have curtailed or suspended security assistance when these standards are not met. We encourage these countries to build a more just, more transparent system that can, that can gain the respect and support of their own people. As we are seeing across the Middle East and North Africa today, courageous people will continue to demand one of the most basic of universal rights, the right to live in a society that respects the rule of law. Any security gains will be short-lived if these countries fail to provide just that. So where we see countries falling short of these basic standards, we will continue to support efforts of people to build institutions that both protect the rights of their own people and enhance our collective security. In conclusion, I want to say again that the paramount responsibility of President Obama and of those of us who serve with them is to protect the American people, to save lives. Each of the tools I have discussed today and the flexibility to apply them to the unique and complicated circumstances we face are critical to our success. This President's counterterrorism framework provides a sustainable foundation upon which this administration and its successors, in close cooperation with our allies and partners overseas, can effectively deal with the threat posed by al-Qaeda and its affiliates and its adherents. It is, as I have said, a practical, flexible, results-driven approach to counterterrorism that is consistent with our laws and in line with the very values upon which this nation was founded. And the results we have been able to achieve under this approach are undeniable. And we divert from this path at our own peril. Yet despite the successes that this approach has brought, some, including some legislative proposals in Congress, are demanding that we pursue a radically different strategy. Under that approach, we would never be able to turn the page on Guantanamo. Our counterterrorism professionals would be compelled to hold all captured ter terrorists in military custody casting aside our most effective and time-tested tool for bringing suspected terrorists to justice, our federal courts. Miranda warnings would be prohibited, even though they are at times essential to our ability to convict a terrorist and ensure that individuals remain behind bars. In sum, this approach would impose unprecedented restrictions on the ability of experienced professionals to combat terrorism, injecting legal and operational uncertainty into what is enor already enormously complicated work. I am deeply concerned that the alternative approach to counterterrorism being advocated in some quarters today would represent a drastic departure from our values and the body of laws and principles that have always made this country a force for positive change throughout the world. Such a departure would not only risk rejection by our courts and the American public, it would undermine the international cooperation that has been critical to the national security gains we have made. Doing so would not make us safer and would do more, far more harm than good. Simply put, it is not an approach we should, should pursue, not when we have al-Qaeda on the ropes. Our counterterrorism professionals, regardless of the administration in power, need the flexibility to make well-informed decisions about where to prosecute terrorist suspects. To achieve and maintain the appropriate balance, Congress and the executive branch must continue to work together. There have been and will continue to be many opportunities to do so in a way that strengthens our ability to defeat al-Qaeda and its adherents. As we do so, we must not tie the hands of our counterterrorism professionals by eliminating tools that are critical to their ability to keep us safe. As a people, as a nation, we cannot and we must not succumb to the temptation to set aside our laws and our values when we face threats to our security, including and especially threats from groups as depraved as al-Qaeda. We're better than that. We're better than them. We're Americans. Thank you very much.
Whatever, whatever you want to do. Uh, uh, as you prefer. No, I'll stand up. Okay, great. So John has agreed that he uh, will answer a few questions, so I'd like to invite anyone who has a question to step up to the microphone. And while you're doing that, I'll, um, I'll uh, throw out the first one, John. Um, you and I have both seen the following line of um, argument that we're operating under a legal framework that's 10 years old in the AUMF, and that as the terrorist groups morph, if they don't already exist, there will exist groups that are not sufficiently linked to al-Qaeda to fall under the AUMF, that, but that pose similar kinds of threats and have similar kinds of motivations. Um, and so these commentators suggest that we need to think about a new legal framework that would ensure that we have the authority to detain or even use force against some of these other groups. Do you think, as we're looking to the future, as our um, subtitle says, that we need to revisit the legal framework? Well, I think we need to constantly review the legal framework to see if it keeps up to date with the threats that we're facing, whether it be on the terrorist front, the cyber front. And as we, you know, confront the different types of security threats that terrorist groups pose, um, so far, I believe that the authorities we have under the AUMF, I as well as, you know, AUMF for Afghanistan, provide us the authority we need to take the actions against al-Qaeda, its associated forces, and that... Um, we have not been constrained to date. If there is going to be a, a further evolution of the terrorist threat, and we believe that we need those types of authorities, I think this is something that we need to take a look at. Uh, there obviously are things that we can do under the different types of authorities that uh, are vested in the executive branch by the Congress. Military actions as well as I mentioned, covert actions. Uh, and so I think we do have the flexibility and the agility to do what we need uh, against certain groups that pose this imminent threat to us. Uh, so from the standpoint of the evolution of that legal framework, I, I do believe that this is something that we need to continue to engage the executive branch and, and the Congress in how we need to confront these threats in the future. The cyber one is really one that we're struggling with right now. You know, we have a legislative proposal up there, and uh, this is something that I think this country still has to come to grips with. What type of, you know, regimen, legal regimen, are we going to have to ensure that our cyber domain is going to be better protected from the different types of, of threats we face? It's much different now than it was 10 years ago in the cyber area. And similarly, I think in the terrorism arena, uh, what we're going to face two, five, or 10 years from now may be different than we have now. But up to this point, I have not felt that the uh, lack of authorities uh, has been a problem. Deborah. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for your remarks. Uh, I want to ask two brief questions, if I can. The first, picking up on uh, Professor Meltzer's question about what's currently um, on the table in Congress, which you also mentioned in your opening remarks, draft legislation that would, among other things, um, try to require detention by military authorities uh, in certain terrorism contexts, and that would also, among other things, depending on your perspective, either reauthorize or expand the authorization for the use of military force that's been the statutory basis for detention um, that both administrations have now used uh, over the last decade. The administration, when that legislation was initially proposed in draft form several months ago, expressed in very strong terms its intention to veto um, that bill. I think principally on the grounds that you mentioned that, that requiring military detention doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, with respect to both that provision and the sort of new authorization for the use of military force language, is that still the position of the administration? This is now attached to an authorization bill that, that uh, includes a lot of other important uh, provisions. So I'm interested if you want to comment on that any further. And, and briefly, the second question, if I can, um, you mentioned, I think, very thoughtfully and, and to some extent as in as great detail as I've heard since Harold Coe's speech uh, to the American Society of International Law, the administration's legal theory of targeting uh, that's been much debated. Purely on a, from an organizational perspective, I'm interested to know uh, how and why the practice is separated as between the military and the intelligence communities. Without asking you to comment in any respect on any operational details, the military has obviously long history, extremely well-developed structures for regulating through rules of engagement and otherwise how the international humanitarian law is uh, sort of enforced in day-to-day -day operational terms. It's unclear, and I think 
um, probably worse than that, that the CIA and other intelligence organizations have similarly well-developed structures, or at least we don't know what they are. How and why would you want to choose between those agencies if you're designing a targeting regime, one that has an established structure for doing this and protecting the rule of law, and one whose structure is, is at least less clear publicly? Right. And the first issue as far as the legislative uh, packages that are being considered right now. We have made very clear to the Congress, both through public SAPs, the Statement of Administration position, as well as through our uh, ongoing contacts with particular uh, committees and uh, senators and congressmen, what our views are. We are strongly opposed to having anything that requires uh, an individual who's taken into custody who might qualify uh, for military detention be put in military custody. To us, and to me, that's a non-starter. You know, we will fight that vigorously. We'll fight a number of other of the requirements that they have put in place. Uh, we're trying to do this in a way that will uh, engender uh, a, a cooperative uh, dialogue as opposed to a confrontational one. I think we ultimately have the same objectives in mind, which is to keep the American people safe. It's how we get there. And what we've tried to do, and I've talked just last week to a number of senators about why is it is that we believe so strongly that maintaining this flexibility and not demanding that, that certain things happen if somebody is taken into custody really does not help us at all. And I think through that, that discussion, that uh, discourse, um, I think we're making some, some progress there is convincing some people about that, that may sound good, you know, it's a, it's a nice talking point, but when you really think about it, it is not helpful. So we're still going to work on this. We, we, we have set a, a number of, of issues that are, are critically important to us that we're not going to uh, bend on. On the issue of uh, defense and uh, covert action, it's referred to frequently in our interagency meetings, Title 10, Title 50 authorities. Well established in law, um, and in both there is, you know, there are decades of, of law and uh, past practice and policies that have informed how we actually do this. There is what's referred to lovingly as the interagency lawyers group that on matters dealing with whether it's Title 50 or Title 10, uh, the interagency lawyers will get together and uh, to look at what is being proposed and then have that discussion that is very rich um, about whether or not what is being proposed is consistent with the law and consistent with past practice or are we actually sort of now going in, in new areas and new directions. You know, I was, I was really disappointed to see the New York Times article this morning by Charlie Savage, front page, that talked about this great debate between Harold Coe and Jay Johnson. And um, you know, it made it sound as though, oh my goodness, the administration is split on this issue. There's this great you know, fight that's going on. You know, whenever two lawyers get together, it's been my experience that if they're not debating, they didn't go to a school like Harvard or another law school, you know, and they're not worth their salt. You know, there are nine lawyers who get together on a regular basis. It's called the Supreme Court. And they actively and rigorously debate the law and the interpretation of it. What we have now within the U.S. government at the insistence of the president and others is that type of discourse among the lawyers that we want to make sure that we hear all the different views and perspectives. That provides us a good sense of what those legal parameters are within which we can work, whether it's in Title 10 or Title 50. That legal framework then allows us as policymakers to decide, okay, these are the boundaries of what we can work in, domestic law, international law, whatever. Now we have to make some policy decisions. And I have never found a case, as I mentioned before, that I found that our legal authorities or legal interpretations that came out from that lawyer's group prevented us from doing something that we thought was in the best interest of the United States to do. So, you know, if it's, if it's Title 50, it goes through, if not as rigorous, even sometimes more rigorous review, because things that we're going to do, particularly in this day and age when, you know, covert action that C falls off pretty quickly, um, and things come out in the papers because of unfortunate leaks. So I think we have to make sure, and we do ensure, that it does conform with our laws, with our values. And uh, you know, I've, been, I've been proud of what this administration's record has been, being aggressive, protecting the American people, but doing it in a way that, again, conforms with our laws and our values. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Ben Weisner from the ACLU. Uh, I really appreciate your being here. I think the administration needs to engage the public on this issue, on these issues, should do so more often, and I particularly appreciate that you're 
taking questions. Uh, I want to ask you about something that you have not addressed today, uh, and that is the use of terrorism watch lists, particularly the no-fly list, which, as you know, expanded following the failed Christmas Day attack in 2009. Uh, I can understand the administration's position uh, that you would want a list like that to be secret, that you wouldn't want to tip off somebody who's on that list before they show up at an airport, uh, that they're on it. Uh, What's harder for me to understand is why, for U.S. citizens, uh, after they're turned away, sometimes repeatedly from flights, and have been effectively tipped off that they're on a no-fly list, uh, it isn't possible to provide some process for them to clear their name, some place for them to go to hear the charges or evidence or innuendo against them uh, and to rebut that. You know, of course, if they were charged uh, for terrorist crimes, they would hear the evidence and they would have lawyers and they would have a trial. Uh, It seems to me this kind of system uh, allows the government, when it has less evidence, to provide less process. Uh, And do you think that there is a way, for U.S. citizens at least, uh, that the government could provide uh, some kind of notice and some kind of opportunity for them to clear their names? That's a very good question, and it's one that we have actively debated within the U.S. government just within the past 12, 18 months. Uh, the ability of U.S. citizens to find out whether they are on that uh, watch list. There are different views within the U.S. government. Uh, right now, the decision is that uh, you know, people, as you say, you know, if they go to apply you know, or buy a ticket or try to get on a plane or something, you know, they, they, they find out about it. Um, th- th- this, is, this is where the balance between um, openness, transparency, uh, and and uh, ensuring that we respect the, the privacy and civil liberties of individual privacy rights and civil liberties can bump up against issues related to investigative efforts, investigative techniques, whatever. And there are those within the administration that argue that uh, one side of that and others that argue on the other. I, I, I share your concerns in terms of U.S. citizens, uh, you know, in terms of having that ability to find out. Uh, it is continuing to be under active uh, discussion and debate. And I, I appreciate the question because it is something, this is the type of thing that really where the tension between sort of uh, you know, what we should be doing in terms of you know, how we handle these, these situations, particularly with U.S. citizens, need to be addressed. I, I appreciate it. Just one quick follow-up to Deborah Perlstein's question. Does the CIA have a drone program? Well, I think, <laughs> as you know, um, covert actions are designed to be covert, and therefore a lot of things are written therefore, in the paper. Therefore, we only read about them in the newspaper. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. If if the agency did have such a program, I'm sure it would be done with the utmost care, precision, and in conformance, conformance with our law and our values, if such a program existed. Hi, Mr. Brennan. My name is Deborah Papowski, and I teach here at Harvard Law School. Um, I wanted to Thank you for your comments today and um, tell you that I appreciate the statements about upholding the rule of law. Um, But I hope you'll forgive my questions here in the sense of those of us that have been following the the government's actions for the last 10 years may have some questions about that commitment. And um, one of them would be, do you feel that you, as um, in your, when you were in your position of Deputy Executive Director of the CIA from 2001 to 2003, whether you were um, acting under the same commitment to upholding the rule of law and values that you talk about today? And then also to the extent that you know, the understanding of rule of law is um, relying on a stable and legitimate system of laws and one in which uh, the law is applied equally to all, is, uh, including the president and government officials, how you and the administration reconcile your vision of the rule of law that you uh, voice today with the fact that despite that we have documented evidence that the CIA was involved in the unlawful use of force and disrespect of human life, that um, some of those officials, none of those officials have been prosecuted or been held accountable. And in fact, instead of being subject to those same laws um, that we subject other people to, are holding high-level um, positions, high-level positions, and in fact are speaking in distinguished panels here, um, as we will see tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Um, the first question, you asked whether or not I felt as though I was upholding the rule of law and our values when I was at the CIA, um, which I was at for 25 years. 2001 to 2003, I was the Deputy Executive Director of CIA. I was there the day of 9-11. I think I was the last person on the seventh floor of CIA when we sort of had to evacuate the building. Um, for the, uh, the period of time in the next uh, almost two years, I served uh, to ensure that the agency was able to respond agilely, quickly to the threats and get folks out to Afghanistan so that we could find al-Qaeda and prevent another attack. 
Uh, that was a period of time also that the agency was involved in enhanced interrogation techniques and uh, custodial detentions that have been, you know, subject of much discussion and debate. Uh, I have said publicly that I, have, I disagreed with a number of those practices, like waterboarding. I was not in the chain of command. I expressed my views. Uh, I guess I could have resigned from the agency at that time, but I felt as though I was part of a national effort to protect American citizens. And there were things that were going on in the government at the time that uh, you know, I didn't think were consistent with at least my particular standard and barometer of rule of law. Uh, but I felt as though I had a, a, a job to do. Um, that was a very, very difficult time. A after those attacks, we didn't know what we were facing. There were widespread reports that we were facing uh, WMD threats, nuclear, chemical, biological, radiological. Uh, we had the anthrax attacks. We had the sniper in Washington. A lot of things were just coming in. I don't agree with the number of the decisions that were made at the time, but I can understand the motivation for them. They were well-meaning. Um, and then it gets to your second question, which is then why uh, are people who were involved in these types of activities able to participate in conferences like this and were not prosecuted, you say? I think there has been very, very rigorous uh, efforts to look at what actually took place during that period of time. Now, you may disagree with the uh, decision memos that came down from the Department of Justice at the time that authorized those, uh, the use of certain tactics and procedures. Uh, when the Attorney General and OLC and others, uh, as well as the agency lawyers, say that this is not inconsistent with our laws, this is something that can be done, and we're given that type of direction. Again, they can have honest debate about whether or not those were good legal memos and good interpretations of the law, but that was what people were, were given, and that's why they do the, did their work. What is still being looked at is whether or not any individuals during that period of time exceeded the authorities that they were given based on those legal interpretations. In my view, if they exceeded those authorities and there were very strict memos and parameters of, of what types of activities were allowed, those people should be prosecuted. They shouldn't be given a free pass, particularly in something as, as sensitive as this. So, you know, this is a period of time we can look back and we can really try to take people to task for following direction and orders that in hindsight now some people may say that should never have been done. You know, when I, when I look back at that time, as I said, there were very, very brave people uh, who put themselves and their lives at risk and did things that uh, were in conformance with the uh, authority and directions they were given. Um, so again, the motivations, I think, were, were pure. I just think some of the tactics and techniques are things that uh, clearly you disagree with, I disagree with. Um, and that's, that's what makes this country, I think, great. Just one quick thing. I just wonder if, if, the, if law can be defined and shifted so, so broadly and so quickly, I just wonder what whether that leaves any meaning to the concept of rule of law. Well, you know, you bring up a great point when I was, you know, talking with folks and putting this together. I said, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, although I've spent so much time with, with lawyers, people like you and others, that I really have enjoyed it. I always wanted to be a lawyer when I was younger. And We're going to give you an honorary degree, John. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are things like, you know, as, as important or as, as dear to our values uh, in our country, uh, things like abortion, things like the death penalty, you can have people who are going to interpret the law and our values different ways and argue it strenuously. And that's just the interpretation of the law. There, you know, is it black, you know, is it black letter law? There are some things that are black letter law. You know, don't go, don't exceed 65 miles an hour. There are other things that sort of give you a sense of exactly, you know, what, you know, the, again, the parameters are or the guidance is. Well, you take a look at some of the statutes that come down from Congress, you know, in terms of what you're allowed to do. You know, you'll find inconsistencies from one statute to another. So, you know, I, I, I take your point, and can the law shift that, that, that much? That was one of the main points in my speech here, that when the security threats are so damn serious, we sometimes will react. And in some of these legislative proposals right now that I see folks on the Hill who are, you know, screaming about we need to change our laws, we need to put everybody in military detention, I say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, let's remember who we are and what we're fighting for, what we're trying to defend. So, you know, can there be shifts? Yes. And those shifts are affected, whether we're attacked, you know, on 9-11 or other types of, of threats and challenges to our, our system. This is where I think this active debate in a place like Harvard Law School, which, you know, should be the place that's going to continue to think through these issues on all sides, 
That's why a Harold Cohen and Jay Johnson, when they get together and talk about these things, they really want to wrestle to the ground. Is there a right answer? You know, truth is elusive, as is right. Thank you. So I think we have time for about two more questions. I do have two questions. Uh, John <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more questioners. <laughs> Um, Jennifer Rizzo from CNN. I wanted to ask you about uh, lower-level terrorists in countries like Somalia and Yemen. Is it okay to go after lower-level, middle-level terrorists in those countries, or is it only okay to go after the higher-level higher level terrorists? Um, do you want my second question now, or should I wait for a response? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think about the first question. The second question is about uh, detention of terrorists at, or suspected terrorists at Bagram versus detention at Gitmo. How is detention at Bagram preferable than detention, or differs from detention at Gitmo? Okay. Um, on the, the first one, as far as low-level fighters, obviously, you did read Charlie Savage's piece in the New York Times today, which was talking about that issue. Um, and there are, two, there are two good examples. There, there are uh, groups in, the main group, terrorist group in, in Yemen is Al-Qaeda in the Raven Peninsula, AQAP. It is a group that carries out terrorist attacks as well as involved in an insurgency in the southern portion of Yemen. It has attacked our interests. It has tried to attack us here in the homeland as well as in Sana'a. There are elements of AQAP that are part-time members. Some are tribal elements that have you know, aligned themselves with al-Qaeda for a particular period of time and for a particular purpose. Their agendas may be very local. Similarly, in Somalia, you have al-Shabaab. There is a portion of al-Shabaab that is trying to carry out attacks like they did in Uganda. Uh, against uh, foreign interests, against Western interests, including against the United States. This is an element within al-Shabaab, which is a large collection of different tribal elements, warlords, uh, groups that are engaged in an insurgency inside of Somalia, which is a, basically a land that is ungoverned. Thousands in al-Shabaab. Now, looking at al-Shabaab and AQAP, both of them, there are elements of them that present a threat to us. And we are taking actions to mitigate that threat to us in both countries. Sometimes those threats are because somebody's at the operational command, sort of the equivalent of a bin Laden or somebody else, who is orchestrating that, engineering it, preparing the materials, thinking about the plans. There are the individuals, the operatives, the facilitators who are carrying them out, the suicide bombers. So you have people at all different parts of the network, both in AQAP as well as in al-Shabaab. And according to, and consistent with what I was saying here, our interpretation of the law is that it allows us, and we feel obligated to, take actions to mitigate those threats that these terrorist groups and these individuals who are associated with al-Qaeda pose to us because of what they can do without, again, massing their troops at the border and, you know, giving us the signals that a state is going to actually march against us. So we will take actions, whether it be in Yemen, whether it be in Somalia, against those elements that pose a threat to us. Second issue as far as difference between Bagram and Guantanamo. Well, Guantanamo is, you know, that's our facility on the island of Guantanamo. It's, it's not subject to any foreign sovereign state. And so, therefore, uh, that was the, one of the reasons why it was, the, it was the principal reason why it was selected as a place to put these individuals that we brought into custody after 2001. Bagram is in Afghanistan. There are certain understandings and agreements that we have in place right now with the Afghan government, but over time and after we remove our troops there, there are going to be understandings and agreements, just like we are going through now in Iraq, to turn over a number of those facilities. So you put individuals in Bagram. Now, those who are captured on the battlefield in Afghanistan, Taliban and others, you can bring them in and then they'll be subjected to Afghan law. You know? People asked, well, why didn't you put Warsami in Bagram over there? Why did you have to bring him here to the States? Well, you bring him there, and then, again, it's going to be subject to issues uh, in terms of the sovereignty of, of Afghanistan as well as how it could complicate what we're trying to do with him as far as you know, prosecuting him. So there is a real distinction between the two. I think that's why we have to be mindful of where we bring people. You know, and Guantanamo, as I said, we're not going to bring people there. We're not going to send people there. We're trying to reduce the population there. We're not trying to increase it. Uh, as, a, as for the, uh, the formulators of the waterboarding guidelines, I presume some of them were lawyers. I, I remember stories about a, a group of two or three lawyers in, in the vice president's office. I can't remember the guy's name. I do, but I won't say. 
<laughs> anyway, I, I was just wondering whether uh, your department might be interested in pursuing some kind of retroactive uh, uh, corrective action uh, against, uh, if not uh, the vice president. I mean, the, the, formulator, the formulators of the policy, who uh, particularly, I would suppose, the, the, the lawyers who who formulated that policy might be subject to some kind of sanction. I, I can't. I can't imagine. Perhaps disbarment. I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't really know. But I, mean, I was wondering whether you, would, in, in your capacity in Homeland, you are in Homeland Security. Right? No, I'm in the White House. You're in the White. House. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, whether, whether anybody in the White House is considering this or has considered this or uh, might consider this. Well, uh, okay. I got your question. Um, corrective actions are something that's in, critically important. And whenever there's been an incident in this administration, I know in previous administrations too, you take a look back at what happened and see what could have been done differently to either prevent that action from occurring again or how you can, in fact, mitigate some of the vulnerabilities or the threats associated with it, whether it be Fort Hood or other places. To me, we're doing that all the time as far as what type of actions we can take that will prospectively help us. Your question is whether or not those lawyers – and for that matter, you know, there's discussion about the psychologists and doctors who are participating in some of these things as well. Should they be subject to some type of either legal sanction or professional sanction? Now, you can argue that maybe some of the legal memos that we'll put together were not really worthy of a lawyer. And so should a lawyer's judgment or ability to put together a legal brief then potentially subject them to sanction? Um, you know, I'll leave it to the professional associations to decide that. But if it's a different judgment than someone else would have come to, I am really concerned about that because if you're going to sanction somebody because their interpretation of the law was not your interpretation of the law, then I think we're getting to a, a point where contrarian views are something that will be um, inhibited. So, you know, if they exceeded their authority, if they did something that was unlawful or administratively not allowed, yes, then sanctions should be taken. But if they were trying to do the job the best they could and consistent with the law and their authorities and their responsibilities, I don't believe that sanctions should be you know, taken. Well, John, thank you very much for that strong defense of the rule of law and for coming here today. <laughs>